So Great guy. I absolutely adore David. Hi, my name is Gil Robertson, president of the African American Film Critics Association. Today, in association with the American Cinema Editors, we are presenting our final spotlight of the year, talking with legendary editor, Ms. Macy Hoy. Ms. Hoy is responsible for two of my favorite films of all time, What Dreams May Come and The Joy Luck Club, which I can literally quote you scenes from uh, <laughs> verbatim. Uh, thank you for joining us today, Ms. Hoy. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity. This is gonna be fun. Absolutely, absolutely. So, I mean, tell us about your beginnings. You know, I know you're from Vancouver, uh, but where did your interest in the creative arts begin? How, what was the the the, uh, the motivation, the inspiration? Well, you know, it's it's weird how I mean, since I was four years old, actually, was when I wanted to be an actress, and um, when I was in high school, and the guidance counselor asked, "So, what what's your goal? What profession? What do you want to be when you grow up?" And I put down actress, and then of course everybody in the class laughed at me. Uh, because um, that they didn't have those aspirations. And so um, I started out, I like to tell people I started out, started out as a Seattle whore, and that was in McCabe and Mrs. Miller. Um, and that's where I got, you know, my start. But um, up to that point, I was doing some te television in Vancouver, and I was in the theater program um, in Vancouver. So, um, that story, how I got into the theater program was that, you know, my parents owned a restaurant. And so, you know, being a, a good Chinese uh, daughter, I decided, well, I, I'm not gonna tell them what I wanna do because they're not gonna approve. So I decided, well, I'm gonna be a dietitian. So I'm at the college and I see, you know, in the commissary, all these kids and they're having like fun and they're acting, you know, just having fun. So I went up to them and I said, hey, what program are you guys in? And uh, they said, oh, we're in the theater program. I go, really? I said, I didn't even know you had a, th they had a theater program here. And so a couple weeks later, I said, you know what? It's either now or, or never. So I went into the counselor and I said, like, I'd like to switch out of the dietitian program and uh, go into the theater program. And it's very interesting. She was a very nice English woman. And she looked at me and she goes, are you sure this is what you want to do? I go, yeah, this is what I want to do. She goes, well, because there's not going to be any work for you. And I go, uh, oh, okay. I said, you know, leave that up to me. And would you please sign my transfer paper? She signed it. I take the transfer paper, theater program. I was in the basement of the college. And so I walked in and here's this Englishman, right? He's the, the head of the department, Anthony Holland. And I give him the piece of paper and he looked at me and he looked at the paper and looked at me again. And he goes, I think you should think about another profession. I go, why? He goes, because there's no work for somebody that looks like you. And I said to him, I go, well, just let me in the program, okay? And I won't even bother you. In fact, I won't even talk to you. So let, let me do my thing. And so he signed the piece of paper and I just went and did my thing where everybody was, you know, acting and, 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 and uh, singing and, you know, wanting the spotlight. I thought, well, we're doing um, a play called Oh, What a Lovely War, which included all 30 students. And I said, well, they need someone to do sound effects, to be um, a stage manager. I said, I'll do that. And so that's how I got, you know, uh, I took advantage of that in, in that program. And to the day that he died, when I would see Anthony Holland, he would apologize to me. He goes, I'm so sorry I said that. <laughs> I go, you know, in fact, out of the whole group, I, I'm, I'm the only one that's actually doing what they want to do. Wow, wow. Um, you've worn a, a few hats during your career uh, as a artistic director, uh, as a uh, actress, and also as a sound, working in the sound department on films. 
uh, but talk, walk me through uh, your, um, the journey. Uh, let's, before we go there, let's talk about your, the year, the time that you spent uh, running the theater company and, um, and working on the Viola Spole and uh, how that influenced your life and uh, your application to your work. Well, Anthony Holland, I was still in his class. He came up to me and he goes, why, why didn't you go to the, the concert yesterday? And I go, uh, I had to work in my mother's restaurant. He goes, bad excuse. He goes, they're having another performance today and, I, and you are going with me. So he borrowed one of the students' car and he drove me out to UBC, University of British Columbia. And there was the experimental wing and they were an offshoot of the committee. And so I sat in the audience and I watched them perform and a light bulb just went off. I go, wow, you know, I could do this because the, in the group, it was very diverse. They had Latinas, they had um, uh, African-Americans, they had an Asian person in there, Italian. And so I said, you know what, this is what I wanna do. And so that inspired me to after I graduated, I went to San Francisco and I studied with the committee. And then through that group of people, I wound up meeting Viola Spolin and she wrote um, uh, theater games. And so my group started, well, on a rainy day in November in, in you know, Vancouver, um, the government at that time was giving out grants to promote employment. So I said to my friend, Joan, I said, hey, what about, it was like, hey, Andy, let's get, let's you know, create a theater company. So I said to her, I said, you know what, what about this? I become the artistic director and I hire like six or seven uh, actors. The government's going to pay them. And so, and, and, and the goal was to go to uh, correctional institutes, inner city schools um, and to teach theater games and to teach theater games in a way of teaching kids how to communicate in a different way. And so she wrote the, she was great at writing grants. So she wrote the grant and wouldn't you know it, we got a, we got a grant for t actually two years. And so at that time, a friend of mine, she was working with, in this theater called uh, City Stage. And the concept of City Stage was that they would have um, 15 minute plays while you could watch and eat your lunch. And so I said to uh, Ray, the um, owner- Sort of like said, Quibi for theater. Yes, exactly. And so I said, listen, I, we need a place to perform. So, you know, your theater is dark at night can we use your theater to perform? And he goes, yeah. And so that's how we got started, you know, doing that. But, you know, during that time, I met Tommy Chong just before he and Cheech became very, very famous with their album, right? And at that time, Tommy's father owned a strip club. And so that was sparked during the day, daytime. And so for some reason, I mean, Vancouver is a very small town back then. You could call up anybody and they'll answer the phone. And so I said to Tommy, I said, listen, I have this theater company and we need a place to rehearse during the daytime. Would, you know, could we do that? Could we use your dad's facility? He goes, yeah, sure. And so we rehearsed there. And then that's how Tommy and I got talking about theater games and the genesis of, of his work with Cheech. That's part of the, the, the journey, yes. Wow, wow. What, how did you uh, meet Robert Altman? How did that chapter in your life begin? Well, I had the, I had the theater company and I met, they had an open call, you know, and Graham Clifford was the casting director and he's now a very well-known, accomplished director. So he and I became friends and he's, he said, you know, the style that Bob shoots in is very improvisational. And I think that you would be great, you know, in this movie. And so he got me an interview with Bob and I knew I got the job when Bob, he didn't look well. He, I think he was sick. So he was laying on the couch and he said to me, he goes, 
I don't stand up for whores. <laughs> and so I said, oh, I, I guess I got the job. <laughs> and he goes, yes, you got the job. And so I worked on McCabe and Mrs. Miller, I think for like three or four months. And he shot that whole movie in sequential order. So after the show, the movie wrapped, I was unemployed. And I said to my friend, Joan, I said, you know what, Joan, I, I can't live in Vancouver. First of all, it rains too much. There's no work for me. Um, she goes, well, why don't you write a letter to Altman and see, if, see what he's up to? And so I wrote a letter, never got a response, right? But somewhere along the line in January, I think I read that he was doing California split. And so I called, somehow I found his number, I called him. And he goes, well, yeah, you could come down, you know, and watch me work. And um, you have to be here January 4th. I go, okay. Now, my parents didn't speak a lot of English, all right? So for me to go off by myself, it was a good thing they didn't know, learn, know English, right? Just because I knew two people. One was a guy that I went to church with and he was studying at the art center. So I knew I had a place to stay at least a week. And then the other person was Robert Altman. And so that's when I packed all my, when I packed my belongings and left and never turned around, you know, looked back since. So now and, what was it? Then, sorry. No, what was it like being an apprentice on so many of his productions and and sort of finding, you know, your calling uh, through working with him? Well, well, what's interesting is that, you know, I could, I sew, I was a sewing major in high school. And so I met her, his producer, Scotty Bushnell, and they were doing Nashville. So she hired me at, in the costume department as the costume designer's apprentice. So I went to Nashville with them and I went and bought clothes with them and I struck up a really good relationship with her. So then after all that was over, I said, you know, I got to find a way of staying here in California. And so Bob gave me more jobs and I did research on, you know, it was like, you know, you're walking down the hall and he just sort of looks at you, goes, you can research. I go, yeah, I can. And so I, would, I did the research for Buffalo Bill. So then on Buffalo Bill, not only did I do the research, but I also was a wardrobe assistant to Tony Powell, who's won many Academy Awards for his, you know, designs of Death in the Nile and, and many other uh, movies. And then I was his driver. I drove him around because he didn't drive, you know, he's from London. Um, and so one day I'm walking down the hallway. This is back when we had film and Bob had shot a million feet of film and there must've been 20 trim bins lying down this hallway. And it was like a cartoon. I saw this two pair of legs like sticking out. The body was inside the, the bin. And I go and I tap the editor at Dennis Hill. I go, what are you doing? And he goes, I'm looking for two frames of film. <laughs> and he had film everywhere, right? And so I looked at him and I said, well, it looks like you guys need help. And he goes, yeah, yeah, we do. I said, oh, I think I could do this. He goes, oh yeah, you could do this, but you gotta go and ask Bob. And I go, oh my God, okay. I, I'm gonna walk across the hallway and I'm gonna ask him. And so I went in there and I said, listen, Bob, I said, look, the guys in editing need an apprentice. And I think um, I could do it. And he looked at me, he goes, this isn't a film school. <laughs> and I said, well, I know it's not a film school, but I know they need to put like a million feet of film away. And so he looked at me, he goes, well, if it's okay with them, then it's okay with me. And then I ran out of it before he changed his mind. So that was my my introduction to editing, but because I was always around, I made friends with the editors and they would let me sit in and watch what they were doing. And even when Bob would come into the room to give them direction, they would let me stay in the room and listen. So that's where I you know, got all my education was on the job training. And then when they moved into sound, 
then they moved me into sound as a sound apprentice and then I became an assistant. And so, and at that time, Bob was working with, oh my God, the people that were top of their game, you know, Bill, Bill Sawyer, um, Richard Portman, incredible, incredible recording mixers. And they just let me sit there and watch the whole process. And so I use that, that time of my life and I use that in my work today. And, I, and even the improvisation, you know, because you're sitting in the room and a producer will say something that sort of feels mean spirited, right? And then you go, oh, this is an improv. I'm going to improv my way, you know, through this. And so um, that, that sort of nutshell, my film school. And it sounds like you had a, a few master classes along the way. Uh, and that's why I had brought up Viola Scullin because I know her technique involves, you know, a lot of uh, improvisation and, and uh, learning through experience. Um, but what was it about editing that made you uh, know that this was the career for you, something that you really wanted to pursue full time? Let me backtrack to Viola Scullin. You know, they were doing story storybook theater in Vancouver with Paul Sills, her son, and then Alan Alda and that whole team was up there. Once again, for another reason, I got her phone number, I called her and she came and gave us a class, a free class in theater games. And so jumping to why I feel comfortable in this arena, you know, this the, the craft of editing, it just felt natural. I mean, when, when I would sit behind Bob and the editors, you know, I'd have this game that I would play that to see where they would cut to, to see if, if what I was thinking was in line with what they were doing, you know? And so um, I, I think it just felt comfortable. And also I felt that that's where the film is really made. I mean, Indeed. The mistakes that you see in production and, and, and my experience working on set also helped me in editing because when a show starts, I always like to contact the DP, the sound people um, that are going to affect my department. And so that when I go on the set, I've already struck up a conversation with them. And so when I call them, it isn't that ominous voice from the editing room, like, who is she? How, what does she think? She, who does she think she is calling me and telling me what to do? So right away, I already have a relationship. Like, you know, Alexander Grzynski, he was Tyler's, you know, DP for a long time. And he and I became very good friends. And if there was a problem, I would call him and it would be a friendly conversation. And so that he, he knew that I was supporting what he was doing. Um, so then also in editing, it's storytelling. It's how do you tell a story through images? Um, and that I, I really like. You know, another uh, great thing about your career is that it, it seems like it all, all of these earlier steps were preparation for, for you to become an editor. I mean, you... Uh, during the time with Altman particularly, had a chance to really gain an understanding of various aspects of filmmaking, you know, from sound, from, um, you know, script, providing script coverage, research, you know, all of the elements that are really important to filmmaking. I guess that's what uh, you gain from that experience in, in, in its totality. But let's talk about as you stepped away from uh, Mr. Altman's umbrella on your own. I mean, what was your first project that you worked on as an editor? Well, it took a while because I had children. And my advice to men and women who have children, I mean, I took eight years off. I was an assistant sound editor uh, and then I had kids. And then it was eight years before I got back into the business. And during that time, I 
would call my my friends that were editors and say, hey, you know, you guys want, what are you doing for lunch? You want to go have coffee? So I kept that relationship going. And during that time, my husband had, didn't work like for about a year, you know, during that, okay, eight years and then seven years seven years and then the year after he he was out of work and so I said you know what I my I kept my dues up so I'm gonna go back to work as an editor and I happened to call one of my friends um Bill Stevenson and I said look I'm looking for a job and um do you have any work and he goes well I've got something starting about a month but it's apprentice rate I go I don't care I said I just want to get back so from from getting back into, I got that job because I kept in touch with people. And I know that there are a lot of female assistants that couldn't get back as soon as, soon as I did because they didn't um, continue, you know, that the, the relationships that they had before they stopped working. Um, and so from, from there, um, I was at, you know, Raja Ghaznal, who's now a very well-known director. Um, he, um, he did Home Alone too, and he's done a lot of different things. And he was our assistant at the time and he was getting married. And so we, my friend, Dennis Hill, he and I, of course, were with two editors wind up, but at a bar. And uh, I said, he goes, so I hear you getting back in the business. And I go, yeah, I go, why? Do you have a job for me? He goes, well, actually I do. <laughs> he goes, I'm looking for an assistant because his assistant had moved on and started working with another editor. And so that's how I got back in as an assistant film editor. And then through that relationship, I met an editor named Danny Green who was looking for an assistant and he hired me over the phone. And so my relationship was another mentor, another, you know, Danny Green cut Blazing Saddles, MASH, long, long career, an amazing editor, an amazing guy. So I became his assistant and we would go to lunch and he would have a liquid lunch and come home, come home, I mean, come back to the cutting room and start taking a nap. So this went on for a couple of days and I go, hmm, how many times can I read a script? And I said to him before he would doze off, I said, hey, Danny, would you mind if I worked on the scene while you're resting? And he goes, oh, knock yourself out. And so I would work on a scene and around five o'clock, I'd wake him up and I go, uh, it's time to go home. I said, but before we go home, would you mind looking at this scene that I worked on? And he was so kind. He would look at the scene and he would never say, be judgmental about it, right? He would just sort of move things around for me. And he goes, that's how it should play. And then there'd be times when I cut a scene and I'd ask him, I said, Is, can you take a look to see if it works or not? And then he'd look at me, he goes, well, what's wrong with it? I go, what, do you like it? And he goes, yeah, yeah, I like it. And so when he left that show, I became the editor on that show that he left. And I worked with Jonathan Crane on all some other shows that he needed extra help, you know, at, in editing. And so I seem to work best with people who, I don't I just have a feeling about me, I guess, you know, they don't ask me too many questions about whether I can do it or whether I can't do it. And, and so from that point on, um, Danny got another job on There Goes My Baby. And he called me up and he wanted me to be an assistant. And I said, look, I moved up as an editor and I don't want to be, I can't be an assistant anymore. So you have to promise me that when this director hires a second editor, that it's me, it's me, okay? And he goes, don't worry, that's what he does. You know, he shoots with one editor and when he goes into post, he always hires a second editor. And I said, if you don't do that, I said, I will quit. And he goes, no problem, no problem. He goes, but you have to train his girlfriend who's the apprentice. And then he hung up on me, right? And so from there goes my baby, 
He moved me up because I could get along with the director. He was a little, you know, he was a very unique personality type of guy. And then from there, I went on to the player because I got a phone call from Scotty Bushnell and said to me, because look, Bob needs a second editor on the show and um, I'm recommending you. And so Bob called me and he goes, hey, I hear you, you know, into editing now. I go, yeah. I go, what do you, I go, what's going on? And he goes, well, they shot all this second unit footage on the opening of the museum and it's not right. It's it, the coverage is weird. It's wrong. So I want you to take a look at it and see what you think. Okay. And so the next day I went to his screening room and he had shot 30,000 feet of film of the opening with all the movie stars coming in and out. And, and, you know, I sat in that screening room and all I could think was when I finish, he's going to ask me what I'm going to do. He's going to ask me how, how to fix this problem, right? Sure enough, three hours later, four, I don't even know how long it was. He's standing outside waiting for me. And the first thing he asked me is, how are you going to fix it? And I go, oh, okay, this is what you do. You get all the good bits, which you always used to say to us. I said, you get all the good bits, you cut it like ET, you have narration underneath it, the guy announces, share, blah, 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 there you go. Cut it like ET, like a promo. He walked away and goes, Scotty, I got this great idea how to fix the opening of the museum. And so that's how I started working on the player. Wow, wow. <laughs> uh, talk about your process. Uh, uh, what's your, 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 what are your secrets, your editing secrets and tricks? Um, gosh, I, 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 I don't know. I mean, um, when people ask me how, how, you know, I cut the Joy Luck Club, I said, you know what, I have no idea who that was. You know, you feel like writers, I feel like you get, this sounds so spiritual, but, but it's true. You feel like you're being channeled by a higher source, but- You get you, caught up in the zone. You get caught up in the zone and you're just doing it. But I think that, you know, a couple of things that I, I do, and I know quite a few editors do is, you know, you get the script, you read it a couple of times and you find out where, where those sections bump you and then you make a note and then whether the script talks to you on an emotional level and then and then when they start shooting it's the same situation you know you sit you have a conversation with the director about you know he'll tell you what his vision is and sometimes they don't they just hire you and go okay here's the film go cut it and I like those kind of directors. And so anyways, um, I would um, look at the dailies and then get a sense of where the actor or the character was going, going in terms of, I guess the acting technique and, and you, you just get familiar with the actors and the characters. And I think that what, what we all do, what I know I do is like, I look for the emotional truth, you know, are they, are they in the scene or are, and I've seen actors like good actors where they've stepped out and you get this feeling that they're watching themselves perform. And so do you, how do you fix that? A lot of it's, behind the back. <laughs> I can only imagine, I can only imagine. You know what, talk about uh, working on Joy Luck Club, because like I said, it's one of my favorite movies. And, um, you know, you're the one responsible. I mean, the editor plays such a central role in storytelling. Uh, in fact, um, I know uh, Dee Dee Allen is famous for saying that editing is the final rewrite of the script. And so, you know, that movie is amazing. And, you know, all of these years later, it's still, uh, you know, draws a crowd to talk about it. Well, it's interesting because the Joy Luck Club was something that I had, you know, I had read the book and, and I really wanted to work on it. But then when it came time 
to work on it, to, to, you know, for it to go into production. Um, I could sense that Wayne was nervous because he, I didn't have much credits, you know, and so he hired somebody else to start the film. And I came on and then just sort of reworked a lot of what this other editor did. And um, because I told Wayne, I said, look, you, it's an emotional movie. I know these characters because they're my family. They're my mother, my aunts, my sisters. And I said, if that's not, if that doesn't work for you, then, you know, good luck. I'll see you somewhere, somewhere. And, um, but I have an interesting story to tell you before I got to Joy Luck Club. And so after the player, I didn't work for a whole year. Once again, you know, I've got two little kids and I go, geez, you know, well, what's, I, I don't know where the next job is. And finally I get this job of the low budget movie that paid very, very little and I'm working on it. And, and the producer comes in, they take a look at it and I get this really bad feeling that I'm gonna get fired. And so I said to my assistants, I go, this guy hated. First of all, this guy doesn't like me. Second of all, he doesn't like what I'm doing. And so I, I'm gonna get fired. And my assistant said, oh, you're just nervous. That's not gonna happen. So we take a Christmas break, come back January again. Uh, we come back and I'm working and the production manager comes in and he has this look on his face and I knew it was not good. And so he goes, I'm letting you, they're letting you go. And I go, okay. I said, so, and you're hiring the trailer editor, right? And he goes, how did you know? I go, well, you turn the film over to the guy and he got itchy hands. And so he recut it, right? And he goes, yeah, how did you know? I go, I just had a feeling. I said, I know that happened to somebody else that I know, right? So I get fired, I come home and my husband is, was also in the business. He was a gaffer. And he said to me, I said, you know what? Where am I gonna get a job? I haven't worked in a whole year. And he said, all it means is something bigger and better is gonna come your way. And the telephone overlaps his last line like a movie and it was the Joy Luck Club. Wow. True story, I'm not making, so, so first of all, that lesson told me, you can't control anything, you know? You, your, your life, your employ, you know, where you're gonna work, you can't control any of it. So when the universe says, okay, it's time, you got it. And, and all those, the other experiences that I had prepared me for that moment. And so getting back to the, the movie, I have to say Ron Bass and Amy Tan, the way they wrote the script was such a great blueprint because all we, well, the first cut, the first uh, cut was about close to four hours. And so now you've got to start taking out stories because within those stories, there is a timeline, you know? So you are in the present, then you're in the past, but they're in the past past. And you can't move any of those out without affecting the other four stories. And so at one point, Wayne had shot quite a few scenes that are not in the movie anymore. And so once he started doing that, taking one of the blocks out, he had to take blocks out from all four stories. And that's how it got to be like that. And if you look at the movie, you'll notice that there are no dissolves in it, no fade-ins, no fade-outs. There aren't any transitions in it. And the reason that was done was I asked Wayne, I go, well, well how are we gonna do these transitions? He goes, well, I'm not sure yet, but I think we might dissolve in and out, fade in and out. I said, so am I gonna see it before it goes, before the negative is cut? He goes, no, because they're going to do an A and B, meaning we're going to do the dissolves in the lab. And you, I wouldn't have, you know, I couldn't see it because they were doing it in the lab. I said, I want to see a temp of it before we sign off. And so he goes, well, you know, budgetary reason, that's not going to happen. I, I said, okay, 
no dissolves, no fade outs. We're going to figure a way of doing these transitions without without that technique. And so Tim Chow was our sound supervisor and he and I came up with this idea and, and, you know, and with Wayne that we would use the, okay, each woman, each character, um, each family, they were an element. One was wood, one was fire, one was water. And so, um, with the Lindo story where she marries this young boy, right? And tricks herself out of the marriage, her element was fire. And so every time we were with her, when even when she was young, you would in the background was a subliminal sound of crackling a fire. And so when she said, Miss, Mrs., Mrs. So-and-so got her wish, got her you know, the, and the maid got her, her thing. And then I got a one-way ticket to Shanghai. And so underneath that, you heard the sound of a choo-choo train, okay? And then that train, which resembles fire to us, that, that means the fire. And then from there, it overlapped into a streetcar and we're in San Francisco. And music made a huge difference too in these transitions. And so that was how we got in and out of, you know, different time periods and different scenes. That's how we did it, yeah. That is brilliant. I'm actually gonna watch it again uh, over the break and look for those things. And then let's talk about what dreams may come. That was another complex movie it seems to uh, to have edited. Tell me what that experience was like, especially with all of the major CG and animation involved. Well, on, on that show, I was brought on as a second editor and David Brennan was the, you know, the, the editor that I was working with. And he was just so, so generous in teaching me about CGI, you know, because I, got on that show and I go, uh, I don't know anything about this. And so, and Mike McCusker, who was my assistant, who just won an Academy Award for Ferrari and Ford, right? He taught me not to be afraid of visual effects. And so between the two of them, they just had faith, well, David certainly had faith that I could do it. And then Mike became my guide. And, and it was complicated because, you know, when, when they bid out a show, there's somebody reading the script and then they're cutting the movie in their head, okay? So one of my first scenes to help them tackle was when Robin Williams falls into the painting and there's the flower and then it's all this paint. Well, the bid, I guess, was you had to tell the story in 55 shots or something like that. Well, it was like 150 to tell. If, if you didn't have the constraints of the CGI budget, it, it was a lot longer. And so now you're sitting there going, okay, it's like, you know, the ruthless uh, stage of editing. What, what is pertinent to telling this story? What shots do we need and, and how do we, convey it so it isn't like, oh my God, jump cut, you know, all over the place. Um, and so that was one of the scenes that I worked on. And, and I thought that what dreams may come was, was brilliant because that's what CGI, well, should do, transport you into a whole different world, you know, and it isn't about things blowing up, which I can understand, you know, that that is very effective as well in storytelling. But there's this one scene um, where Max von Sydow, Robin and Cuba are, are sailing in the sea of dead, right? And so the shot goes, and then they wind up in the ship's graveyard. So they're in the water and I'm working on that scene and I go, God, I need like a transition of how they see that big pan shot of the ship's graveyard. And I'm looking and I'm looking and I'm looking 
Finally, at the end of the take, I hear Vincent say to Max, okay, cut, and Max looks up. I go, that's it. And what I did there was I slowed it down as much as I could. So when his head comes up, then we see the next shot. And we do that all the time. I know, you know, my colleagues do that all the time too. You find things after they say cut or, or before they say cut, just to, and we're, we're, we're um, frame thieves, you know? And so that made it work. Um, and it helped tell the story because if you didn't have that shot, I guess you could have done it, but to me, it just didn't feel right. Wow, well, it was a, a terrific, terrific film. And I know you've done a lot of work with Tyler Perry. You've practically done um, his entire filmography. Uh, what's it like working with Mr. Perry? Well, working with Mr. Perry, it, it was great. I mean, you know, he didn't know who I was. You know, he hired me and said, okay, here's the film. I mean, he didn't even ask me about my technique or do you use music? I mean, all the stuff that other, you know, directors and producers would ask. And so he would shoot it and I would cut it. And um, I would, one of the things in, uh, that I told him, I said, you know what, we're gonna do this together and we're gonna up the game here so that the audience, your audience will have something, you know, not only um, emotional, um, uh, storytelling, but um, in artistic way of telling your stories. And so I did 14 pictures in seven years with him. And I would go on the set the first week and we, I would sit with him and we'd look at the monitor and I'd talk with, with him. And a lot of times, you know, he would ask me, um, you know, can I use this? Or did you think it was funny? <laughs> and and because all his actors, you know, they improvise. And that's the best part of it is that he does the main script the way he wrote it. And then he'll start throwing ideas out at David Mann and David would just pick it up and not, not a beat. He would continue the conversation. And so um, Tyler didn't know that I had an improvisational background at all. I mean, he, he didn't know that I was an actor. He didn't know very much about me, but I, I, I really uh, appreciated that because he just trusted me. So he would shoot in Atlanta. I'd get the dailies here and then I'd go do the posts here. You know, Mike Wilhoyt was our sound designer. We had our re-recording mixers, the music supervisor and the composer and the music editor, there were only like six of us here finishing the whole show. And so when we were ready, well, first of all, like after my cut, he'd come in and give me notes and then he'd probably see one more time. And then, then he'd turn it over to me to see what things that I wanted to do to it. And a lot of it was like, you know, tightening and, and, and getting rid of, you know, things that, uh, that kind of I didn't like you know, as well. And so then when we went to the mix, um, he would come and watch it and he'd have one or two notes and then off he'd go to start the next one. So, so that was wonderful. You know, and the other thing that, that, that really gave me a lot of confidence in, you know, in my work, because certainly I, I know uh, when I show my first cut to the director it's like a white knuckle flight you know you're you're sitting back there and you, you're hoping that they laugh in the right places and at the end they don't look at you and say okay let's start from frame one and that's when you go i'm out of here <laughs> wow wow well the collaboration has certainly been uh uh tremendously successful so congratulations thank you and then there's miss dolly parton you've done a uh, few projects with her. Tell us what it's like to work with her. Oh my God, what a what a joy. I mean, she is exactly the way you see her in interviews. There's no difference in her personality. She's bubbly and 
and, and, and fun. Um, her, her producer is Sam Haskell and uh, Hudson Hickman. And they saw my resume come through and um, they, they had hired uh, Stephen Herrick who did Mr. Holland's Opus and, and Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. And he interviewed me over the telephone. And of course, he, he hired me. And then they shot in Atlanta while I worked here in, you know, in LA. And the first movie, Code of Many Colors, I hadn't met Dolly yet. And um, apparently, you know, it's a very personal film for her that she watched the opening, the first five minutes minutes and couldn't watch it anymore because she was crying and so the second one Christmas of many colors she came into my cutting room and that's when I got to meet her and so she sat next to me watching it off my a big screen right and she, she's like give me the Kleenex so she starts crying the producer starts crying I start crying, the whole place was like sobbing. And so at the end, you know, she really, once again, another personal story, she really liked how it came, how, the way it was playing. And, you know, she left my cutting room and she walked out to the elevators and people heard that she was in the building. There must have been 15 editors that came out to say hello to her. She stopped and took pictures with every single one of them and then got in the elevator and said goodbye. But she's really, really smart. I mean, it, you know, she came up with the idea of Dollywood. It's like the third most visited theme park in the world. Um, and she wrote all the music. So she's just really a, a, a good person to work with. Very, very kind. Um, how have you seen things change since uh, uh, you started out? I mean, there's still not very many uh, female editors, unfortunately, and certainly there are very few uh, uh, editors of color. Um, are things getting better? I mean, what's what's going on in that space, in your opinion? Well, it's gotten a, a little. It's gotten a little better, but you know, in our guild, there's only still twenty five percent women, you know, and then when you're talking about people, editors of color, you know, once again, it's like less than 12, you know, and I think that um, certainly in the Asian community, I I'm seeing a lot more, but I think it's also culturally, you, you know, like when I was starting, you just didn't talk about going into the entertainment business, you know, the, because um, they equated it to prostitutes and vagabonds and people that didn't have a steady lifestyle. Um, Wait, now, when I did your parents find out that you were what you were really doing? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, they found well, they found out one. Well, I guess um, I told them, you know, that I had transferred out, and at that time, my mother. Well, my parents still had a cafe. And so there was a guy who was our, a regular customer and he was a well-known actor. And he came in and, and, and he said to my mother, he goes, you know what, I, I know you're you know, concerned about your daughter, but I, I'm here to help her, support her and, and look out for her, make sure that she's not gonna get into any trouble, you know? And so that kind of gave her relief. And I also told her, I said, you know, this is something I want to do. I said, it, and if you decide to kick me out, I go, that's, that's the way it's going to be, you know? And so, but um, my brother and sisters were living at home at the time when McCabe and Mrs. Miller came out, right? And so they were going to go watch it that evening after dinner. So my brother and my sister said, okay, when are we going to tell tell them about the bathtub scene. <laughs> so my sister said, well, you better tell them before they go see the movie. And so Danny Green tells the story much better because he sort of embellished it, right? So I'm gonna do the Danny Green uh, version. And so they're all sitting around having dinner. And so my brother said, uh, uh, okay, so you're gonna go to this movie, but 
uh, Maisie's going to be naked. And so six pairs of chopsticks hit the floor. <laughs> and to the day that my mother died, she never talked about McCabe and Mrs. Miller. Well, I'm but sure. She did tell her dentist, you know, after my brother and I got into the business, she would go to the dentist and say, you know, my, my daughter's in Hollywood. Wow, I'm sure you made them very, very proud. Oh, I hope so. So, I mean, do you take part in any uh, incubators or workshops or mentorship programs uh, for up and coming uh, talent in editing? Well, I'm um, the co-chairperson of the diversity committee of the, the Motion Picture Editors Guild, along with Lillian Benson. And so I, we've been, uh, the, it's been, let's see, five years since we started our diversity committee. And I think that has helped a lot um, with certainly the events that we've had so that, you know, people of color don't feel like they're alone in this quest to be, you know, an editor or, or, or succeed in this business. And um, I think that the most important thing is that for other people of color to give opportunities for people like us, you know? Um, and um, I think that the most important thing is your work ethics. It doesn't matter it, what, what ethnicity you are, if your work ethnic, I mean, your uh, work ethics are dodgy, then nobody will hire you. And I think that what's good about the diversity committee is it's open up the dialogue within our guild to promote more diversity. And I was talking to, to a sound editor who didn't quite get it, you know, lovely guy, but he goes, well, I don't see there's a problem, you know, with diversity. And so I asked the guy, I go, okay, so how many, how many African-Americans, how many Asians and Latinos do you have in your cutting room? Oh, I said, that's what we're talking about is bringing awareness, you know, into the, the, the industry and that people shouldn't feel threatened because we want more diverse uh, members, you know, people working. And I think that what it helps is, you know, it gives a whole different point of view of storytelling. And, and sense of humor and emotion and things like that. And so there are, uh, you know, other committees that are now reaching out to high school students, get, you know, an early, uh, to, to interest them early on. Um, and also I think that the biggest issue is editing is not glamorous, you know? People but it is essential. It's, it's essential, right? You're in a dark room and you're sequestered, you're quarantined. So I think a lot of us do well un under the stay in place right now. But, but I, I think that you just have to be open to other people, other cultures, that you have to have an open mind, you know? Um, and, and to know that, that if a person of, of color is up for the same job, you shouldn't feel threatened by that. It just means that, you know, you might have to up your game too, or that's sort of how I see it. You know, and, and I'm interested in helping other, you know, other um, minorities. I mean, certainly, you know, there's a lot of uh, Chinese uh, Asian women that are in film right now that, you know, call and I talk to them about, basically, you know what, it's about politics too. How do you swim in, 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 in this land and not piss anybody off, but get what you want, you know, in the meantime. And, it's, and some of it is, you know, at, in early on, you do have to compromise. But then when you get to a point where you're more recognizable and people respect your work and respect you as a person, then you, you can do uh, 
lot of different things. I mean, I stand up for my crew all the time. I've had producers call up and yell at my, you know, assistant because they didn't get dailies right at seven o'clock in the morning. And I'd call them up. I go, you know what? First of all, you don't talk to my assistant that way because I don't talk to them that way. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I feel bad. I go, oh, well, I think you need to call them up and apologize. Okay, I'll do that. So um, I also look at editing, you know, my crew as my family, you know, that you stick up for your family. And if you stick up for your family, they'll stick up for you too. Um, so I, I think that in a way, you know, change is slow, but the change is happening. It may not be as fast as some people want it to be. And just the fact that we're having this dialogue and, and the fact that we have a diversity committee, I think that says a lot because not a lot of the other guilds have, you know, diversity committees or, or, or have, you know, a vested interest in helping the underrepresented. So that's, um, that's what we're doing. You know, we are really going to have to have a part two because there are, a few things more that I would love to discuss, but our hour is just oh. about up. I want to thank you so much for your time and for sharing with us, for utilizing your gifts to make so many people around the world so happy. Oh, I thank you for letting me, uh, inviting me to this. This was a lot of fun. Absolutely, absolutely. And we look forward to uh, get really talking some more in the future. Great. On behalf of the world's largest group of Black film critics and the American Cinema Editors, thank you for joining us today for our Spotlight with Ms. Macy Hoy. Have a great day and happy holidays.